And if you have not seen Big Hero 6, it is worth a watch. And I wanted you to see that because, did you see how in, involved it is when you rescue? You have to think of new ways. You have to do all kinds of stuff to rescue. You put yourself in danger. You use all your resources. You have to find new angles because the old ones aren't working. Well, next good, Big Hero 6. So if you watch Big Hero 6, please text me and tell me how much you love it, because I think it's amazing. So today we're going to talk about iCrew rescuing. And when the kids were freshly born, and you know what I mean by that, fresh right out of the room. Anyway, um, we brought Talitha home, we brought Bethany home, we brought Jamie home. And it was so hard because they breathe so lightly. You can barely hear them. And I remember especially with Talitha, I would think she was not breathing at all, so I'd go and i go and I'd listen and I'd get even closer. And I'd put my hand there to feel if they were breathing. I'd put my hand on her chest as he was going up and down, you know, like you do. You just want to make sure that everything was okay. And I was ready to go and rescue if I needed to. <laughs> I didn't know they would CPR, but I just knew my presence was going to rescue her if she needed it. Oh, I can't tell you how many times I just wanted to run in and go, oh yes, or well, what about when they're crying and going, I don't know what's wrong, please tell me, and all they say is, ah! <laughs> and you don't know how to interpret that. <laughs> well, anyway, I can just imagine that we've all found ourselves in a situation where we wanted to help somebody. We wanted to help the situation. The only thing is, our helping made it worse. Our helping ended a friendship. Our helping burst a resentment. Or one of us wanted to uh, help a person who was changing. They wanted to change something, so we were helping them, and they were saying, quit manipulating me. Stop controlling my life. Leave me alone. But they're the ones who wanted to change it. You're just helping them by helping. Or what about us wanting to protect somebody from a hurtful situation by saying, oh, it's okay, don't worry about it. I'll go make it better for you. And what happens? You make it worse, because now the person's mad at you, too. Rescuing, jumping in and trying to do something that is none of your business to do. Well, we're not called to rescue. We're called to live a redeemed life. In 1 Timothy 2, 5, it says, There is only one God. Christ Jesus is the only one who can bring us to God. Jesus was truly human, and he gave himself to rescue all of us. Rescuing is Jesus' job, not Kathy's job. Rescuing is Jesus' job, not your job. So we're not called to rescue, we're called to live a redeemed life. So, the Bible teaches us that Jesus is a rescuer, so what does he rescue us from? Well, this is what I found. Hebrews 2.15, but he also died to rescue us who live each day in fear of dying. Jesus rescues us from the fear of dying. Hebrews 9.15, Christ died to rescue those who had sinned and broken the old world. Jesus rescues us from our sin. Galatians 1.4, Christ obeyed God our Father and gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins to rescue us from this evil world. Jesus rescues us from this world. Um, Colossians 1.13, God rescued us from the dark power of Satan who brought us into the kingdom and brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. So he rescues us from the dark power of Satan. Like we say, every chain is broken. We do not have to live in bondage. Break every chain. You know why? Because he can. And he's the only one who can break every chain. <clears throat> Psalm 2517, my awful worries keep growing. Rescue me from sadness. Jesus rescues us from our sadness. Not from the people who cause us sadness, but from our sadness. Psalm 25, 15 says, I always look to you because you rescue me from every trap. Not that he's going to stop us from going into the trap because we have free will. But we, when we are in a trap because of our own decisions or whatever happens, he rescues us from every trap. And Jesus rescues us from a life of separation from God so we can live a redeemed life in Christ because Jesus is our rescuer. Aren't you glad I don't rescue you? Oh my gosh, you never be able to get me on the phone. <laughs> You'd be texting, where are you, Kathy? I need you to come right now. This is happening. Um, Probably get a train because they be 
ATR or whatever isn't working yet, or isn't going to work, who knows? But anyway, you're not waiting 40 minutes. But with God, he's like, I'm on it. I've been there waiting for you to call. That's God. So Jesus rescues me from things, from within things, and through them. Sometimes we're in the midst of the month when we need Jesus to rescue us because we don't know we need this So what happens if we try to rescue people around us? Anybody been there? Done that? Wish you didn't? <laughs> exactly. So I put rescuing people from their struggles, <clears throat> from their pain, and I put rescuing people from themselves. Let's face it, if a person wants to do something, you gotta just let them. Even if we know it's gonna cause them pain or it's gonna cause them a relationship or whatever, sometimes you just gotta let people, you can't rescue them from themselves. So if we try to rescue people by doing things for them that they could already do themselves, we are interfering. It creates an unhealthy dependence on you. So if I try to rescue somebody, the next time in the same situation, they're not going to call out to God. They're going to, hey, Kathy, let's go. I need you again. I know it's 3 o'clock in the morning, but really, can you just come over? I got the cattle on. Bribery. So you can't rescue people what they need to do themselves. And when I act in my own will and strength, and I do things for other people that they need to do themselves, it doesn't work. We lived on a farm, and my parents kept saying, do not help the chicks come out of the eggs. Do not. Well, of course I'm going to try. <laughs> so you do. You help them. You see the little thing come through, so you help. You know what? They're not as strong as the other chicks. They're just not as strong. It takes them longer to get on their feet. It takes them longer to do what they need to do. Because they have to struggle to get out of the shell to be strong to face what is coming at life. They have to do it themselves. I'm robbing God of his rightful place of being their source and endurance. When I run in and I rescue somebody, it's like me. Me. If I got the shirt, I helped you, I rescued you. I did that. No, they need to wear the shirt that said, God is my helper. God is my strength. God is my redeemer. Not Kathy. I'm trying to get out of place when I jump in and I'm trying to rescue someone. I am taking from God what belongs to him. Stealing is a sin. Oh, and I'm stealing from God, which is a double sin. <laughs> so I can't steal from God what is his place. I cannot go in and try and do that for someone. The second thing is, if we try to rescue people by easing their pain, it leads to enabling. Do you know what enabling is? It doesn't sound bad, does it? It's not like a help word in there. Able. Maybe it's not so bad. But enabling is bad because we make excuses for people when we enable them. Oh, I know, but just give them a break because this is in their past. I know they've done that four times. Maybe the fifth time they'll be okay. There's one thing to be a positive person, it's another thing to enable. You cannot make excuses for people's poor choices or bad behavior. Sometimes, Call a spade. That's right. That's right. So when I interfere by enabling, I am not allowing God to do that deeper work that needs to be done in their lives. I'm not letting him go the distance in their lives. I'm cutting it short. I remember one of my kids, um, when my mom was dying, said, I need to go and talk to Grandma about this situation because it's bothering me. I said, oh, don't worry about it. I already talked to her and she's fine. Oh my gosh, do you know how much I regret that? If they had have gone to my mom and said, Grandma, do you remember this situation? I am really sorry. They would have cried and hugged and had a beautiful moment together with God. I loved my child of that moment because I was in the Boy, do I regret that. I hate hearing around my baby regrets. I hate it but it stops me from doing it again. My rescuing hinders people from knowing their faith in God. It's like, oh, it's okay. I'm putting a Band-Aid on everything. That's not my job to do that. It causes them to be weak in their trust in God. It causes 
are going to be weak. They're not as strong in God if I run in and try and rescue them. God is no longer at the forefront of the decision making because they have to run all their decisions by me because I am the rescuer. I'm the one who can help them. I can't, I can't, I can't. Do you see a pattern of I, me, me, I, instead of God can? Why don't you go pray about that? Why don't you ask God? You're not hearing from God? Well, you keep asking him because he will give you an answer. It will be yes, it will be no, or it will be wait. <laughs> but he will give you an answer. So when I take things into my own hands, that's what's happened. When I try to rescue people by protecting them, I am controlling and manipulating. And when you try and rescue people by protecting them, you're being controlling and manipulating. Now, it's because you love them. You don't want to see them in pain. You don't want to see them struggling. You don't want to see them hurt. It hurts you, remember? When my arm got broken, you got broken too. It's true. When our kids are broken, we're shattered. We're not broken. We are shattered when our kids are hurt, aren't we? Isn't that the way it goes? It hurts us more than it hurts them when they come home and they've been bullied or they didn't get the job they wanted. And you know, it just hurts us so much because what do you want to be? You don't want to hire my kids. They're great. What are you talking? I'm gonna go talk to that boss. I'm gonna get you your job. <laughs> I've never done that that I remember. <laughs> So because it becomes controlling and manipulative, instead of God being their shield and protector, their approval and esteem comes from me or you instead of God. So rescuing, all we're doing is replacing God in a person's life, and we are not to rescue. We're to let God do that. His timing is perfect. We want to come in and make every boo-boo better, and he's like, no, I need them to hurt a bit more because they're not to the point of surrender yet. Just wait. And isn't that hard as parents to just wait and let your kids suffer? Oh my gosh. God, why did you make us this way? Tuesday, we were studying um, the 12 women of the Bible. And last Tuesday was the Canaanite woman. And Naomi said this about, in her talk, she said, Jesus is in the dark and broken places. And when I try to rescue somebody from a dark and broken place, I'm blocking God in my I'm, I'm this big shadow, and God can't get to me because I'm holding him back. Because Jesus is there with our kids, with our loved ones, in the dark and low, broken places. When I'm in there trying to shelter them from what God is trying to do in their lives, I'm blocking him. I'm stopping him. Who am I? How, why would I want to stop God from doing something? Well, because he's not doing it as good as I would. <laughs> Isn't that what we think when we're doing it? We might not come out and say it, but that's what we're thinking. God, you're not doing a good enough job looking after my child. i got to step in and do something. Wow. I have a lot to answer for when I go to heaven. I was going to say, Kathy, remember all those times you were playing football with me and blocking your kids from what I really wanted to do? It's like, oh my gosh. Actually, oh my God. <laughs> that's what I do say. So that's why I stopped being res that's why I quit rescuing. And you know what? I had to learn to stop being rescued myself. I used to say this, I wish I had a friend just like me. Someone who would jump in and do all the things I do for other people. Someone who would say the kind things that I say to other people. I wish I knew someone just like me. You know why? Because I wanted to be rescued. I wanted someone to come in and rescue me because God was putting me through a struggle I didn't want to go through. So, I had to quit rescuing and I had to stop wanting to be rescued because I cannot expect other people to do for me what I need to do myself. And you can't expect other people to do for you what you should do yourself. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't ask for help. Yes, <coughs> ask for help. But you need to be smart about it too. You know when you should be doing something yourself. Come on now. You know. Don't check and you know that person that you can ask and they'll do anything for you? You know that person. She's called Kathy. <laughs> Actually, I'm getting better. So when I say no, don't take it personal. Just take it from God. Unless I say no. If I have mean eyebrows, that's just my pleasure. But if I say with a smile, you know that's God. Okay. <laughs> Two person. So I no longer want to poorly assume a role 
do you remember the guy that he said, oh, my arms, wait a minute, I'm in a suit. Remember him? He's my favorite character in that cartoon. He's wonderful. Anyway, that's what I do. I'm assuming a role that was not me. He was trying to be this <coughs> big, uh, and I don't remember what that suit was called, but he's got a name for it anyway. So I'm not trying to be that big suit. I'm just this little tiny human being who has no powers except for the spirit of God in me. And I cannot assume to be God. I was hurting people as I was trying to help. And I may have even hurt some of you in my attempts to rescue, to help, to make. And I am sorry for that. No, no, don't tell me about it. It's okay. Just forgive me for now. <laughs> if you need to tell me about it, I will gladly listen. Because I don't want to rescue you from something that you need to do. If you need to tell me, please go ahead. Um, and there is no sense of peace or the presence of God when I attempt to rescue. There's no peace there. When I'm attempting to rescue, my thoughts are going a million miles a minute trying to think, how can I do this? What can I do? It's like that. I've got to find another angle. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. There's no peace and there's no presence of God. I had empty actions, tired emotions, and overstretched finances. Can you relate to that? Let me say those three things again. Empty actions. You do stuff, but it doesn't help. Tired emotions. You're exhausted from trying to do things for people that they don't really want you to do, but you're doing anyway. And overspent finances. You gave something that you should not have given. You overbought. You were, and sometimes when you are a rescuer, you try and buy people off with gifts or money. You try, oh, I'll buy this for you because you're going through a hard time and make you feel better. Well, if that's what God tells you to do, great. But if that's what you're telling yourself to do, don't do it. Save your dollar ninety. <laughs> that's how much a large tea is, by the way. <laughs> so I want to tell you a story, and I've told you this before. Um, my son was going through a hard time, and uh, he was very low. And uh, it was just really tough. And I would lie beside his bed and pray, God, just let him grieve. I just want to hear him grieve. And I could hear him. And I would peek and I'd see his chest rise and fall, rise and fall. I'd see his nostrils flaring. He was fine. He was breathing. But it was a hard time because I could not rescue him. I couldn't rescue his emotions. I couldn't rescue his body. I couldn't rescue his spirit. I couldn't rescue anything. He just had to go through it. The carpet was wet with tears where I was laying. My ribs were sore because you know you get to the point where you cry and there's nothing coming out and you just go, <gasps> been there? Yes. Okay, that's where I was. My spirit was broken and lame. It was numb. I could not feel the presence of God in that room. It was just gone. I had nothing left in me, and all I could do was surrender. So I said, God, have your way. He's yours. He always has been. I don't know what I think I'm doing, trying to be everything to him. I can't. So I had to quit rescuing. I had to let go and let him struggle through it. I have really good rescuing skills. I mean, they're really, really good. I've practiced them for years, and they work. But they did not work in that situation. I had to let go, and I had to let him build his own faith. He had to find his own experience with God that cannot be shaken, and I had to allow him to stumble and fall flat on his face. Mm. If you see your kid falling, what do you do? Oh, 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 oh. You try and catch him, right? Mm -hmm. I had to stand back. I had to stand back and just let him fall flat on his face. Surrender to the Lord is the only way to get through a struggle like that, and it's the only way to get through when your kids are struggling. <clears throat> Even though they're your kids and you're attached to them, they're separate from you. So when I say I can't let my kids struggle, I have to do something, what I'm actually saying is, God, not your plan, my plan's in motion here. Stand back. This is the Kathy plan. It's better. And I say, I don't trust you to be able to do this. I think this way is going to work better, God. Well, when, um, when my son was laying there, and I was laying beside him, something changed in me. It didn't change in him. 
changed in me. I couldn't feel God's presence, but I had an encounter with God. And then his presence came. <laughs> you know, like that whole Moses burning bush thing? I had that there on the floor with God. And it shaped me for what was coming next. It shaped me. It changed me. And when you have nothing left, and you have no strength, energy, or desire to get up and do anything else, it's only God that picks you up from that. So God's plan contains growth spurts. <laughs> you know, your kids are doing really well spiritually, and then food. <laughs> it's just like when they're little, and they're running, and they don't know how to stop, so they bang into the wall. That's what happens with our kids, even when they're adults. And sometimes, pain is the initiator for change. Sometimes, pain is the pathway or it's the cost of change in our kids' life. And that's really hard to stand back and watch. So when I say, I'm sorry, God, this isn't going to happen, and I'm telling God to move over, I'm saying, move over, God. Mom is in charge. <laughs> that's it. Move over. I'm taking over here because it's not working. And uh, that never turns out good. So, I tell you that story about my son because I've told you before, because there's a part two. I know. God is fresh. Did you know that? Every time uh, he has an appointment for you to speak to a person, he has something fresh for you to say. So this is fresh for you from God. So, our grandson Hudson was born, our little twin cousin over here. He's three weeks younger. And uh, he was born by emergency C-section, so he had a lot of fluid still in his lungs and his navel cavities, and he was having trouble breathing. And he would, uh, he didn't know how to clear his nose, so he, you know, they had to suction it out and everything. And if he was struggling, they needed to pick him up and pat him to help him clear it. And uh, that was really hard for Jamie and Sarah, to listen to the little one's struggle to breathe. Doesn't that just break your heart just hearing those words, struggle to breathe with a newborn? It hurts. So anyway, um, I went over because Jamie and his job, he had to work till really late, just after Hudson was born. I said, no problem, I'll come over and I'll spend time with Sarah. So it was about 10.30, Sarah went to bed, and Jamie came home about 11.30 midnight, and I said, you know what, honey, you're so tired. Why don't you go to sleep and I'll stay all night? <laughs> really? I said, yes, leave Hudson down here with me. I'll feed him and change him. You guys go get a good sleep. Wow, what a, what a delicious night that was. That was awesome. That was really, really good. So anyway, Jane was saying, you know what, Mom? It's really hard to sleep. Because all they do is sit there and watch his chest go up. <laughs> I put my hand in his nose to see if his warm breath is coming through his nose. And I sit there and I watch his chest go up. Yeah. Well, guess what came back to my mom? <laughs> So anyway, later, I said to him, I said, you know what, Jamie? That's what it was like for me. When I lay beside your bed, and you were struggling to breathe, and all I could pray was, God, let him breathe. Just let him take one more breath. I said, that's what it was like for me. Oh my gosh, I got a beautiful God moment. <laughs> but he knew exactly what it felt like. And I said to him, and Sarah was there when I was saying this, I said, do you know how hard it was for God to look at his only son and say, just stop breathing. Mm. Mm. Just stop breathing. How hard would that have been for Father God to say to his son? Because he knew what had to come next. And in order for Jesus to accomplish everything, he had to stop breathing. Matthew 26, 53 says, Don't you know that I could ask my father, and right away he would send me more than 12 armies of angels? Peter had just cut off the soldier's ear because he was rescuing Jesus. <laughs> You're not taking Jesus. I'm going to fight you to the death. Meanwhile, this is Jesus' plan. This is the way it has to unfold. Jesus has to be a 
arrested and tortured and crucified and laid in the tomb so he could go down and conquer death and so he could rise again and bring us salvation. But Peter was trying to do it a different way. He was trying to make a shortcut. No, you're not doing it this way. Peter's in charge now. I'm going to do this, this, and this. No, that wasn't God's plan. Not at all. God could have rescued his own son. Mm -hmm. He could have sent 12 armies of angels. But he didn't. Do you know how hard it is for Father God not to rescue his son? Think of how hard it is for you not to rescue your children from a relationship or a pain or a financial struggle. God did not rescue his son from death. Not just death, a crucifixion. He didn't do it. Jesus had to go the full course to accomplish the depth of salvation and redemption that we have today. And we look at Father God and we think, yes, you know, God, you know, this is your plan, Jesus died, blah, blah, blah. But now when you look at Jesus died, it's like God had to let his son die. How hard is that? A shortcut wouldn't do, and a compromise wouldn't last. What if Jesus didn't die on the cross? It wouldn't do, would it? It wouldn't do. God the Father didn't interfere or rescue his son from the pain of accomplishing something eternal. And when we jump in and we try to rescue our friends, our family, our co-workers, our church family, we are doing that. We are interfering with what God wants to accomplish that is eternal. John 18, 11 says, Jesus ordered Peter, put back your sword. Do you think for a minute I'm, go I'm not going to drink this cup the Father gave me? Even though Jesus knew exactly what every sip of the cup the Father gave him entitled, he was willing to go through it because he knew that was, as I said before, the better way. The better way. God's best way. So we parents, we want to give our kids the best that we have. We want to help them through life, through disappointments and heartaches as much as possible. And that's okay. Don't stop loving your kids or listening to them and being there for them. But pray and say, God, am I trying to rescue them? Am I interfering with what you are trying to do in my kids' lives? Or is this something you want me to do? And that's when knowing the Spirit of God comes really handy because then you know the difference. And that's called discernment. Uh, when we interfere in rescue, um, we hurt them. And we need to figure things out. We need to, problem, we need to let our kids problem solve. I heard... Um, on the radio that um, we don't give our kids enough uh, bored, bored time. We don't let our kids get bored enough. When kids are bored, they get creative. They start to think of things themselves and do things themselves. When we're filling up every minute of their day, all they're learning to do is follow the program. Mm -hmm. So we need to let them do that. We need to let them problem solve. We need them to let them grow and mature, gain wisdom, and we need to let them learn from which means we need to let them fail. And that's really hard. We, uh, all of our children are married now, and they have wonderful spouses, by the way. And um, it's really hard sometimes not to rescue and interfere in what goes on in their families. Sometimes, uh, for whatever reason, things happen, and they tell mom and dad, they don't want mom and dad to run in and rescue them. You know what they want mom and dad to do? Listen. They want mom and dad to pray, and if God says to do something, do it, because then I will be eternal. But if you just rush in and say, oh, here, here's $150 for that bill that you can't pay, what does that teach them? Hey, my mom and dad, their new name is CIBC. <laughs> that doesn't work. So sometimes our kids' struggles teach us more about ourselves than about them, don't they? Yes, it does. So the breaking is necessary. Our kids need to be broken. We don't need to break them. Life does that on its own. But we just need to be there to love them when they're broken. Just like the shell of the seed needs to break open, the seed, nothing happens. You might as well eat it. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. So the struggle is important. So how do we stop rescuing our kids? How do we stop rescuing people? 
how do we stop rescuing people on the street or whoever comes into our presence? This is how I did it. And it might be a little different for you, but I think the principle is the same. My identity in Christ frees me from being a saving one and enables me to live redeemed. I'm not the saving one. We thank you, Alicia. I love that song, The Saving One. Jesus is the saving one, not me. He's the saving. He's one who saves us from everything, not me. So my identity in Christ, me being a daughter of Christ, it frees it, it breaks the chain of me having to be the saving one. It saves me from the responsibility to rescue. I am not responsible to rescue anybody. I can't do it, and I am totally incapable of rescuing people. I am inadequate to bring resolution, peace, and joy to people. You know why? Because Jesus is the saving one, and that's his job. I can't redeem or take back hurts, pains, or setbacks. You know why? Because I'm not the saving one. Jesus is, and that's his job. I can't heal wounds that go deep. You know why? Because I'm not the saving one. Jesus is. Um, he's the only one who can. I can't. And I cannot do what God can do. And I was not made to be the saving one. Jesus is and he is the one who is the saving one. So I quit rescuing, and I am enjoying living redeemed. Now, the big question. Do I still try to rescue people? Of course. Of course I do. I am a codependent person. And it is just built in me. That's one of my character defects, that I am codependent. It's something that I fight. I wrestle with all the time. Sometimes I fail. Sometimes I rescue and I get controlling or manipulative or I enable people. I do, but I recognize it now. But for most of the part, I quit rescuing and I quit wanting to be rescued. You know why? Because Jesus is the same one and I'm only called to live redeemed. So I hope you have a wonderful Mother's Day. I hope that uh, you get all the food that you enjoy and all the hugs and kisses that you want and that your love tank is full and 